Good morning. My name is Aditya Patnaik. I'm an investment advisor at Sprott. And the following excerpts are from a discussion I recorded with Rick Rule on the 7th of February, 2023. Rick, I'd like to start our discussion today uh, with the question of why now? I was curious about the timing of the boot camp. Um, I, I was speaking to a friend recently who works in the cement business who, when I was talking to him about the silver market, told me that it reminded him a little bit of the, of the cement business that he was in, where over a 10-year period, they tend to have one or two great years and eight or nine terrible years. Uh, and, and the silver market uh, reminds me a little bit of that, where it doesn't do... Uh, anything for long periods of time, but can be re very rewarding to investors if they happen to be in the market over those one or two good years. So I'd like to start our discussion today with a question on why you are conducting the boot camp today uh, in, in terms of the timing of the boot camp. Uh, is it because you see something uh, interesting in the silver market where we may be headed for uh, one or two good years uh, somewhere down the horizon? Or is it more related to the fact that silver con continues to be an out-of-favor commodity and silver stocks continue to be out of favor right now? Very much the latter, Aditya. Um, you make money. Well, what attracts me to the silver market right now is really two things. My prior experiences with it, I describe myself as a silver beneficiary. And the fact that uh, silver speculators are in despair. Your friend makes a good point, which is to say that silver rewards you extravagantly, but infrequently, much like cement. And were your friend not to invest in productive capacity in cement when the competition was absent, he would not be able to reap the rewards during those good markets. Similarly, in my experience, when the silver market moves, it moves so dramatically that you are either in the move, in front of the move, or you miss the move, or more likely, you buy at the end of the move and move down with it. I've observed investor behavior around resource markets generally, but silver markets in particular, uh, and seen that in the silver market, when the narrative is its most broadly placed, it's because the price action has already devalued much of the narrative. I look, too, with amusement at silver speculators who care about a dollar move or a $2 move. Uh, there aren't very many speculators who I know that are good enough traders to take advantage of even $2 or $3 moves. What attracts me to the silver market is its propensity for doubles and triples uh, and the propensity of the silver equities to magnify the gains in the metal. I am also, Aditya, after grading now 80,000 portfolios uh, in the last five years, very conversant with some of the mistakes that investors and speculators make. And so I think, as with the uranium boot camp, the knowledge that I've gained by interacting with 80,000 investors around their portfolios, including their silver portfolios, makes me better able to sculpt a silver investor's boot camp than I would have been two years ago before I had much less experience, real time experience with people's portfolios. So let's talk about the price of silver. Uh, when I think about the variables that control the price of silver, there's the inelasticity of supply uh, because of the large proportion of silver that is mined as a byproduct. Uh, there's its, it, its split personality as a monetary metal and an industrial metal. Uh, there's the, the paper and deri derivatives market, which is driving the price. And then there's investment demand from ETFs. When you look at things like the supply deficit in 2022, when we had a 200 million ounce deficit, which was the largest in a decade, the price of silver went from 25 down to 18, and now it's back around $22. So even something as big as a 200 million ounce deficit didn't really move the needle for silver prices. Uh, with gold 
you've often talked about how investor sentiment is really driven by a realization that you're losing purchasing power in traditional savings instruments. So with silver and silver prices, uh, what, in your opinion, is the primary driver going forward? Is it industrial demand or is it momentum being established in the gold market? In the near term, I would say momentum in the gold market. I would point out with regards to the price volatility of late, uh, and I don't know the reason for this, Aditya, uh, but I would point out that in the three silver bull markets that I have experienced before in my lifetime firsthand, that gold has had to lead silver. Uh, and that the fear buyer, the monetary buyer, the gold buyer establishes the precious metals narrative. And gold itself establishes the precious metals, mo precious metals momentum. It's only after leadership has been exhibited by gold that silver moves. I am of the view now that because of the bad arithmetic around U.S. Treasury securities, that sooner or later, perhaps sooner, uh, we will see the beginnings of a genuine gold bull market. And that, I think, will cause a broader narrative around precious metals. And certainly, I hope, uh, a, a dramatic market around silver and silver equities. I've seen that progression three times before in my life. I'd sent you a chart of the natural gas price recently, which showed that the price per MMBTU had gone from a dollar fifty to nine dollars, back to uh, two dollars fifty over a two-year period. The the speculative forces that set prices in the margin in the nat gas market seem to work very effectively and freely in both directions, up and down. Uh, in silver, I have noticed that positive news such as the deficit in 2022, often has a somewhat muted effect on the price of the upside, while negative news tends to have a very exaggerated effect to the downside. And, and silver also tends to trade over a much narrower range. The, the price move this past Friday on the back of the jobs report was a good example where the price of silver fell by 5% and some of the silver stocks were down 10%. Do you agree with the observation that silver price is being managed down by traders who are not allowing uh, true price discovery uh, based on supply and demand? I believe all markets are manipulated. Uh, it's been proven that LIBOR has been manipulated. It has been proven that precious metals markets, including silver, have been manipulated. But I don't believe that there has been a thorough, ongoing, decades-long conspiracy to reduce the price of silver or reduce the price of gold. I do believe that there has been ongoing central bank interference, both by way of jawboning and occasional market, act, uh, uh, um, market efforts, uh, when the precious metals prices have threatened to break out because of the lack of confidence that that might engender in fiat currencies. I don't think, however, that the big thinkers needed for 40 years to engage in a conspiracy to depress the price of silver and gold because the strong U.S. dollar was doing that for them. They didn't need to suppress it. I remember very well, Aditya, during the decade of the 70s, when trading desks conspired to increase the price of silver and gold the same way that lately they have been de decreasing the, the prices. Uh, trading desks as manipulators do what is absolutely easiest for them. And the easiest way for the last 40 years to manipulate the price of silver and, and to a lesser extent gold has been to the downside. I remember precisely those shenanigans taking place on the long side during the decade of the 70s when the easier way to manipulate the price of gold and silver were higher. One of the things that we really hope to uh, cover uh, in the boot camp is the extraordinary relationship between the futures markets, the derivatives markets, and that part of the silver market, which is available for good delivery. Uh, this is truly an astonishing fact. I can't 
tell you what all of the ramifications of it are. But I think that people who are interested enough to invest their money or speculate with silver should invest some time to begin to ponder the incredible imbalance between the paper, the paper silver market and that part of the physical market, which is available for good delivery. I'd, I'd like to switch gears and talk about silver equities. Uh, silver stocks, as you've noted often, are a supercharged way of getting leverage to silver prices. Uh, and I should add that it works in both directions, up and down. And now, now the silver equities market is very small and very volatile and is also very limited in terms of quality. But as discussed earlier in the introduction, the price moves that you see across all of these equities often does not reflect the value, the underlying value in, in, in the stock. So I wanted to talk about how you think about value in, in the silver stocks. And, and I'd like to have this discussion in the context of beta and alpha in, in uh, a silver equity portfolio. So let me start with the beta side of things. Um, if, if you exclude companies like KGHM and the large diversifieds like Glencore, uh, I came up with about 15 investable companies listed on exchanges that we follow. So excluding places like China, right. where they produce over 5 million ounces of silver per year. Now, what's interesting is that the share prices of a lot of these companies are trading very close to levels where they were at in 2019, when the silver price was $15. And um, uh, equity dilution is not being considered. So there may be some equity dilution in that equation. But when I look at, through the financials and I compare the top line and the bottom line numbers of a lot of these uh, silver producers, uh, the top line revenue has only grown marginally despite the price of silver going from $15 to uh, wherever it is now at $22. And the bottom line measured by net income has fallen for most of this group uh, over the last couple of years. So we haven't really seen an increase in either margins or in market capitalizations of most of these 15 silver producing companies. So the silver mining business continues to be very marginal at prevailing prices. We had talked about how for gold companies, they appear to be historically cheap when you use the, the, the net asset value, which is the measure that you like to use. Uh, most silver companies are trading above one times NAV. So I'd like to get your thoughts on how you think about valuations in the silver sector, given that most of these companies are marginal today. And, and do you look at value and leverage in the silver sector differently from the way you look at it in the gold space? Do I look at value and leverage differently between gold and silver? Yes, absolutely. Uh, beta investments, for the reasons that you've discussed, are difficult in the silver space. Difficult uh, both between, because the number of truly beta-oriented uh, or, or qualified companies is skinnier than you suggest. Uh, a 5 million ounce producer is a company that's generating $100 million a year top line. Uh, for me to really sort of think of a company as a beta style investment, uh, the company would be needing to produce more like 15 or 20 million ounces. The second thing is that silver's geographical dispersal is fairly tight. And to be in the silver space means necessarily that you're going to be in Peru and you're going to be in Mexico, which are both countries that are arguably, from a political and economic point of view, digressing in terms of their attractiveness to silver. Never mind Russia, of course. So it's a very challenging place to be a beta investor. During the period of time 2000 to 2010, and then the much more recent mini market, while the gold companies were relatively aggressive at M&A and at new project developments, the silver companies, the primary silver companies, were much less active. There were some acquirers, some amalgamators. First Majestic comes to mind. 
uh, Pan American comes to mind. But the circumstance has been that they haven't been able to affect top line growth because they haven't been as aggressive in developing and maintaining uh, a pipeline as the gold companies have, or certainly as aggressive uh, as the copper companies have. What offsets that, Aditya, is the market's incredible response. I know I've said that 15 times in this interview, but the market's incredible response to silver equities when the silver market gets the narrative. These things go from fairly priced or a little overpriced uh, at a certain silver quote to grossly overpriced at a silver quote that's triple, uh, which means that the leverage inherent in the shares for those who can wait out difficult economic conditions is incredible. By its very nature, the silver business is more alpha-oriented than beta-oriented. I've, I've made this comment a few times that there's silver market is limited in terms of quality. But if you look at the share prices of a lot of companies, they tend to uh, work based on leverage, as you've said, in, this, in a rising tide. Yep. So, so how do you differentiate quality and leverage in a silver portfolio? Or do you do that, given the nature of the market? Where quality is available to me, it's easy. Um, I was able some years ago to own... Uh, Pan American and Silver Wheaton, <laughs> and that was my Silver Beta. These days, uh, it's a, a bit more challenging on the Beta side, but probably increasingly less challenging on the Alpha side, uh, which is to say you look for companies uh, very much like I did in 1990 with Pan American and Silver Standard. Uh, companies that aren't going to make you any money at 22 or 23 or $24 a share, uh, par pardon me, an ounce, but will give you quantum increases in margin uh, at 30 and $35 uh, an ounce. And you own them in the percentages that correspond with the amount of money that you can hold in categories where the narrative begins with if. When you and I talk to prospective investors, uh, Aditya, what they all want is maximal gain with minimal risk. The problem with that is it doesn't exist. Uh, and so people must own silver stocks understanding the time frame, understanding the volatility, and understanding the risk. People are attracted to silver stocks. People came to you to buy silver stocks because they know, historically, the amount of leverage, positive leverage, that silver equities enjoy relative to almost any other asset class on the planet. And that leverage doesn't exist without a cost. When I screen the, the universe of silver companies out there, I came up with about 15 companies that were producing silver out of the ground. Yep. Uh, and I just used an arbitrary cutoff of 5 million ounces for scale. Uh, I also found about 20 or 30 companies that were not producing silver out of the ground, but had a, a resource base of over 50 million ounces. Most of these companies, when I looked through your ranking scale, I think there were only a handful that actually were in your tier one ranking scale. So most of these companies would not rank very high based on the criteria that you use for quality. Out of companies that are producing silver and out of companies that simply have large, very low grade resource bases in the ground, do you have a preference in terms of how you play the silver market? Or is it is it a combination of the two? I want uh, yes, I have preferences, uh, and I need to say I have uh, preferences that vary depending on the portfolio that I'm helping someone structure. I, I would say generally that since we don't know when silver is going to perform, that we need to own a company that's durable, uh, which is to say 
uh, either has enough cash and assets, uh, even if they're pre-revenue, that they will continue to be viable until we think is a reasonable time frame for silver to perform, or companies that enjoy enough cash flow, either from silver or silver and gold, that they will be around. I'm reminded of Doug Casey's old quote, when the wind blows, even turkeys can fly. If you believe that to be the case, you need to buy some fairly well-fed turkeys so that they can survive until the storm. And thus is true in the silver market, irrespective of whether you are an investor or you are a speculator. I would note, too, that the rankings that you refer to, uh, uh, Aditya, are less total return rankings than they are risk-adjusted return rankings. So I give uh, in my rankings uh, higher marks to uh, a gold company or a copper company or an oil and gas company uh, than I might to a silver stock. Although in my own portfolio, for that portion of my portfolio, where I'm trying to own five baggers, 10 baggers, or 15 baggers while, exper while exposing myself to substantial risk, I I'm willing to do it. Uh, in the smaller silver stocks, uh, two things. Uh, one, optionality, which is to say large deposits of silver, which aren't economic at this price, but would be stupidly economic at higher prices. Uh, with a low market capitalization is a place to look. A second place to look, because they are so rare, uh, are high quality silver discoveries, particularly high, high quality silver discoveries of over 100 million ounces. These become, in a silver bull market, must own deposits, because as we've discussed earlier, the silver industry has not done uh, enough of a job with regards to filling their exploration and development pipelines. And they are all at these silver prices with these levels of capital commitment, in effect, cannibalizing themselves over the long term. Uh, if as and when silver returns to favor and, and their cash flows from silver go up at the same time that their cost of capital goes down as a consequence of share price appreciation, what you will find is that the high quality and very high quality discoveries uh, get sold for property for prices that make an old value analyst like me blush. I, I wanted to ask you this question because I often get asked about the shareholders when people look through the list of silver companies. Eric Sprott comes up very often. Uh, and You've described yourself as a value analyst. Um, how would you differentiate your style of investing in silver from Eric Sprott's style of investing for the benefit of the audience? Uh, three things. Uh, Eric has patience that makes me seem impatient. The second thing is that Eric has amazing tolerance for risk and failure. Eric believes that a speculative stock that he, he loses 85% on is the price of making 1,500% on something else. Eric understands that every action he takes is based on probabilities, not certainties. And Eric is much more disciplined than people think with regards to investing and speculating within his own capabilities. That's partly because he's so rich. Uh, you know, 10% uh, of a billion or a billion two portfolio is still a fairly formidable sum of money. And Eric is absolutely uninterested in beta. He is wholly interested in alpha. His beta is already taken uh, care of from his point of view uh, in his incredible investments in bullion. Uh, you know, Eric is looking for good returns on his bullion, but he's looking for outsized returns on his speculation. Uh, he does that by combining uh, iron discipline, I would say, uh, in terms of 
portfolio sizing made easier because his portfolio is so big, uh, but also his appreciation for the psychology of a market when a sector takes off. It's important to note that there was a point in time when Eric was a small cap growth investor back in the 1990s because he understood the economic climate that we were in. And he understood with a cost, with a uh, falling cost of capital in a growing economy, the type of operating leverage that existed in small cap growth stocks. When the tech thing started to blow up, when it got overpriced, uh, Eric switched to precious metals just in time for a pretty good precious metals bull market, the 2000 to 2010 bull market. Eric continues to believe that uh, the market is betting the wrong way on, in particular, government securities and bonds, and that the primary beneficiary of that will be gold and silver, and that from his point of view, the incredible narrative leverage lies in silver. He is a different type of speculator with a different mindset than most mortals. Okay, so we've talked about the price of silver. We've we've talked about a few key topics in terms of a silver portfolio. I, I wanted to just touch on touch the tip of the iceberg here. And so, are there any other key questions and topics that you would like for speculators to take away from the boot camp on Saturday? What I would just tell uh, investors and speculators is that their biggest risk in silver is themselves right-sizing their portfolio, understanding the portfolio, uh, having the psychological and the financial ability to handle volatility, which certainly you will uh, encounter. And then when the time comes, and I know this seems like a long time away, Aditya, having the maturity to be able to sell too. It's odd, but when an investor buys a $100 million market cap stock that goes to a billion dollars, in other words, when they enjoy a 10-bagger, they are often more attracted to the stock at its advanced valuation than they were when it's cheap. So while I realize that that's a problem that many people dream of, I have watched literally thousands of people round trip gold and silver. I'm not saying there will come a time when you sell all of it, but there does need to, to, to come a time when you need to transfer from something that is out of favor and hence, or pardon me, in favor and hence comfortable to you to something that is out of favor and hence uh, uncomfortable to you. Just as I'm suggesting that speculators do the same thing now in favor of silver, there will come a time uh, when investors will need to remember the way they feel now and take steps in terms of selling some of their silver so they don't feel like that again after the silver market recedes.